So we're doing GI, and we're going to be doing tubes this week. So from mouth to anus, all right? Yes, mouth to anus. And then uh, next week will be all the organs. So what are the GI organs, just for recap? Pancreas, not stomach. Stomach is part of the, the tube. Gallbladder, pancreas, and liver. All right, so that's all next week. We might touch on a few might hit them a little bit, but really we're talking about mouth to anus today. All right, just so all the tubes. All right, that's okay, all good. All right, so we're doing from the mouth. I guess that's a mouth, right? All right, I don't know why I'm drawing a mouth to anus. Anyways, we got esophagus all the way down to the um, lower rectum, right? So let me, let's actually draw a good one. All right, so let's draw a good mouth and a good anus. All right, so we got a mouth here, right? We got the esophagus, okay? We're gonna go into the stomach. And really, small intestine, we're not gonna deal with too much, but large intestine, yes, we'll deal with large intestine a lot, right? Comes out back around. We got a large intestine going across this way, across that way, and to the sigmoid, okay? All the way down to the rectum. We'll be dealing with the rectum a little bit today as well. All right, so we have our, our slides set up. We'll do an esophagus first. We'll make our way to the stomach, and we'll talk about intestinal issues and all the way down, okay? I'll draw on the board here as we go over different uh, pathologies. These slides have been condensed, so they're, uh, it's, it feels you can feel good about yourself that you've got like four slides for esophageal CA, or I got two slides for hernia. So it, it, it feels more doable because if it was like multiple concepts per slide, then you'd get, get out of the hand, all right? And so there is a little bit more information per slide, but in the in the end, it's kind of like those. Uh, those books at the library where you cut the Titanic in half and you can see all the stuff on one page, right? You can see the person, you know, going to the bathroom at the corner, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? These those BK books or RK books, whatever they're called. Anyways, so we're doing GI. And when you study any disease process, you want to understand the uh, general stuff, all right? So I'll do general stuff. And we'll talk about causes, all right? Slash risk factors, okay? And then we'll be doing uh, signs and symptoms. And that can also include your diagnostic tests. And usually we have a slide like on a diagnostic test. That's whenever we refer to diagnostic tests later, we're gonna just refer back to that slide. So we talk about EGDs, we have a slide on EGDs. We have a slide on colonoscopies. So you just refer back to those slides. It's usually the same, same prep, same consent, all the, all the things, same things, right? And then we got some treatment. Sometimes you can put complications first, but complications. All right, even complications sometimes have their own thing because like dumping syndrome, all right, that has different causes and different, uh, different complications we talked about today will have different causes sometimes. Sometimes you want to break those guys apart just a little bit more, like what are the specific symptoms for those, right? You don't want to over, you don't want to get too busy on each one of these. You want to try to keep your, uh, this table as succinct as possible. And the last thing is nursing interventions, right? It's basically what wasn't covered before, right? Because your nurse intervention will be monitored for this complication, give this medication, monitor side effects of that medication, right? Explain to the patient what the disease process is. Those things are kind of understood, right? So we'll be doing, uh, you just want to kind of do things that are unique, right? Like we talk about GERD and hiatal hernia, there are specific things we do. Like, you know, weight loss is for every disease process ever. But for this one, for instance, would be, you know, sleeping habits. What are some great sleeping habits, some sleeping teaching I have to do? That's unique, right? That's not a complication or a treatment or a cause or anything like that. Okay, and we'll, and these things you can fill in the blank as we go on through. All right, but yes, first we're talking about the esophagus. All right, so we have the mouth and the esophagus, and we're talking about disease processes there. The first one being hiatal hernia (HH). Okay, let me know if I'm going too fast. I'm on a little on low sleep and a lot of caffeine. Okay. There we go. All right, so esophage esophageal disorders. We'll be doing hiatal hernia, or HH. And we'll be doing GERD, which stands for what? Gastroesophageal reflux disease. And there's a lot of overlap between these two, right? The teaching, the sleeping, all the things that you know, causes, there's a lot of overlap between hiatal hernia and GERD. So we'll try to differentiate that for you. 
and then esophageal cancer. So at the end of each one of these sections, so at the end of the esophagus section, we'll talk about esophageal uh, cancer of that section, all right? At the end of stomach stuff, we'll talk about stomach cancer. At the end of colon stuff, we'll talk about colon cancer. So the three cancers to know for, for GI, or for the GI tubes at least, because next week you have to know about liver cancer and pancreatic cancer. But for this week, you have to know about esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and colon cancer, right? So there's a lot of disease processes, so that's why I want to try to, you know, try to arrange yourself, you try to get an overall view. So on the board over there, I'll be drawing a little overall picture of what, so you're not losing focus and all the details. And all the details are there and the pictures are there to help understand the main concepts. There's a lot of main concepts to, to take home. So those are things you want to um, try to don't get lost in all the details. And of course, you can always ask me, do I need to know this detail? I'll oftentimes tell you no, that's too detailed, all right? So hiatal hernias. Okay, so here's hiatal hernia. We've got GERD right there, so we're focusing on hiatal hernia right now. A hernia is just anything where it doesn't belong. So we have a top of the stomach, specifically this little Z line right here, is making its way, it's slid up in, past that diaphragmatic hole. And that diaphragmatic hole is called the hiatus. So hiatal hernia is something going through that hiatus. And guess what? It could be more than just the top of the stomach. It could be the whole stomach. It could be the transverse colon. It could be a lot of things. It can just make your way all the way up there. Obviously, the more things that are up there, the more symptoms and more uh, damage and more distress your patient will be in, right? Then GERD, or sorry, as soon as you start moving things up through that hole, this little opening right here, that what's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And what's a sphincter? It's a muscular opening that can close, right? So the mouth is a sphincter and the anus is a sphincter, right? And what's the next sphincter down? We've got the upper esophageal sphincter technically, and then we got the lower esophageal sphincter. And what's after the lower esophageal sphincter right there? L-E-S, lower esophageal sphincter. What's the next sphincter? Pylorus, all right, pyloric sphincter. What's the next sphincter after that for extra credit? Not pictured here, but it's the ileocecal sphincter. It's between the small intestine and the large intestine. There's a little, a little sphincter right there, right? It's an important sphincter because when we talk about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is anywhere, right? Whereas ulcerative colitis starts at that, that sphincter, okay? All right, so when this, these, this anatomical structure makes its way up there, that sphincter no longer can sphincterize, right? We can no longer close, good. Therefore, we start opening this little space here, and now we can have all those GI contents make their way up and splash up against the lower esophagus, and that's gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? So first, talk about hiatal hernias. All right, so slippage of the stomach through the hiatus, all right, the hole at the bottom of the diaphragm. So if we were to open someone up and crack them open and we look underneath the diaphragm right here, there's a little hole right there, and that hole is the hiatus, and that's what we, that's what the esophagus comes through, and it's going to attach to the stomach, right? So this little lower esophageal sphincter sits just below the diaphragm, okay? And there's technically a little line right here called the Z line, and that becomes important when you talk about Barrett's esophagus, because uh, that, that can start changing shape, changing uh, cell structure. Okay, so usually you have a squamous epithelium, and the squamous epithelium is what's usually on surfaces that require a lot of friction, right? Like food passages and sword swallowers, right? There's a lot of friction going on there. So we, once we get to the stomach, they become rugae, right? So the reason why we bring that up is when they do an EGD, they, do, they scope them, they say, oh, your rugae are not where they're supposed to be, right? They're, they're, your rugae are above the diaphragm, therefore you have a hiatal hernia. This has slipped up, upwards, right? So for instance, here's an example. Let's see if I can play this without skipping the slide. All right, so you can see how the, it just slide all the way up there, all right? So that little sphincter is now above the diaphragm and there's now rugae above the diaphragm, okay? So this, this diaphragmatic hiatus is what creates the boundaries of the gastroesophageal junction, that's this little piece right here, and the lower esophageal sphincter, all right? And this, when you have a hiatal hernia, it's distorting the shape, but it can no longer close. So now you have the inability to close, you're gonna start getting symptoms, right? And the symptoms are because of this gastric acid and how, what's, how, what's the pH of this hydrochloric acid down there in the stomach? This brashing hydrochloric acid and stomach contents, what's the pH of that? 
about two-ish, right? Two to three, which is very, very acidic, right? And it's going to start brashing up against this uh, lower esophagus and the stomach that's there. And it's going to start causing erosion and causing damage, okay? So here's an intact sphincter right here, and then the bottom left is not intact, right? All right, so you start getting damaged that lower esophagus, and that can start leading to what's called Barrett's esophagus and even esophageal cancer. All right, so it's important to manage it and avoid the uh, causes and fix the causes and teach to fixing the causes, right, which we'll talk about. It affects up to 80% of American adults. And why does it affect 80% of American adults? Because 66% of them are obese. So obesity is a strong risk factor for hyal hernias. Okay. So what else? So stomach's bulging upwards into the, what cavity is that above the diaphragm? The thoracic cavity. So do you think they're going to have some shortness of breath? Yes. The worse the, the hiatal hernia, the more short of breath they get. All right? That's one of the distinguishing factors between hiatal hernia and GERD. GERD, you're going to get the heartburn symptoms. Hiatal hernia will get heartburn symptoms too. But the, you don't really get short of breath with, um, with GERD. Right, you get short of breath with hiatal hernias. Okay. All right, so here's that little Z line here and that gastroesophageal junction and the lower esophageal sphincter. So we're going to zoom in on those a little bit. This little study right here is lighting up the stomach, and they can see that it's above the diaphragm. Right, so here's the diaphragm right here. You can see that study is lighting up. What kind of study is that where you can light up a, a GI tract? It's called a barium swallow study. Right, so, so it's a little, they just swallow a little liquid that it tastes great, like cherry flavored. And then uh, they swallow it and they shoot an x-ray and they can see it light up and see if there's a de defect or not. Okay, so normal esophagus, all right, it's a 25 centimeter tube for passage. It has two sphincters, a top sphincter and a bottom sphincter. And the bottom sphincter is where it's at. That's where we're gonna be really talking about uh, disease processes and uh, lifestyle change, lifestyle things that cause the lower esophageal sphincter to fail, okay? So it allows food to pass from the top to the bottom. And do you think it needs to squeeze into the stomach or it just kind of falls in the stomach? What, which one has the higher pressure? Thorax or the abdomen? Thorax does. So the esophageal sphincter is a muscular sphincter and it's going to squeeze all of that food and globus, globus. What's a globus? It's just a bolus of food, all right? It's going to squeeze that globus down into the stomach, right? So if someone is obese or someone has increased intradominal pressure, you're not going to be able to squeeze easily, and you might even squeeze stuff upwards into the esophagus. So you might squeeze the whole tube up through the, through the hole in the bottom of the diaphragm. What's that hole called? The hiatus, right? And you get a hiatal hernia that way. Okay, so we can either just be just be straight intra-abdominal pressure that's too high, or it could be a weakened sphincter, right? It can weaken with age, it can weaken with smoking, it can weaken with calcium channel blockers, it can weaken with a lot of different things. So we'll point those out. I think in the next slide. Okay, so these low, lower esophageal sphincters, all right? These are uh, you know there's certain pressures there. It could be super weak. Right? So like we said, like age, for instance, it gets super weak. The, ten, the muscles and the ligaments aren't as strong as they were when they're 20-year-old lower, lower esophageal sphincter. Right? Compared to an 80-year-old, they're going to be different strengths. Right? So we're going to have a weakened sphincter is a possibility. Right? The, 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 the tone is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, or it's greater than 45. The only reason why I bring this up is because they can, you can actually measure this. They'll stick a tube down your esophagus, and they'll measure what's called manometry. They'll measure the pressures in the esophagus and the stomach, and they can you know, taste the pH, too. So if they taste pH above the sphincter, you know that there is acid making its way up there. Right? You can take this home with you, and you can do a 24-hour ambulatory test where they can detect all the different pressures and pH changes throughout uh, in your esophagus and in your stomach. Okay? Any questions on that? We can have a high pressure due to push from the stomach. There's something pushing upwards, right? You have a strong lower esophageal sphincter, but you have a stronger abdominal pressure, right? What's an example of who has strong abdominal pressure right now? What can cause that? Pregnancy can do it. Ascites, which is pregnancy of, <laughs> of fluid, right? So you have just too much abdominal pressure. It can push that all the way up there. Okay, so here's another example of a hiatus, I think. Let's see, double check here.
Hmm. I thought it was a, oh, it's a GIF. Okay, I thought it was a video. I was trying to look for the play button. Anyways, so we have all this acid making its way up, and it starts to cause erosion of that lower esophagus. Okay, so this LES or lower esophageal sphincter is what we're going to focus on. All right, so you either have a weak LES where your hole is too big, or you have a strong LES but your abdominal pressure is too big, or you have a diet that's causing a weak LES. Okay, it's called transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, TLESR. All right, so let's say your, your lower esophagus can just weaken with what you eat. Okay, so causes. So we got increased intra-abdominal pressure. We got a weak LES or we have a weak hole. All right, a, a, hiatus, a hiatus that is weak. Like we said, with age, all right? 60% of those over age 50 have a weak hole. All right, so just wear and tear. Or it could be something congenital. That could be a reason you have some kind of like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or something where you have weak con uh, connective tissue. Uh, trauma, that could certainly push it up upwards where you have trauma, sorry, trauma to the hole where you have some kind of diaphragmatic injury or diaphragmatic uh, trauma of any sort, okay? But more commonly, it's gonna be increased intra-abdominal pressure. You are pushing really, really hard, right? You're pulling, either pushing hard because you're, uh, you know, you're helping a friend move and you're not gonna help them anymore in the future because that was way too much work when you're over age 30, or you are doing what? This is where your ice cream comes from. Oh. The creamy poop of a mystic unicorn. Totally clean, totally cool, and soft serve straight from a sphincter. Mmm, they're good at pooping. But you know who sucks at pooping? You do. That's because when you sit on a porcelain throne, this muscle gets a kink in the hose and stops the Ben and Jerry's from sliding out smoothly. Is that a problem? I don't know, are hemorrhoids a problem? Because sitting at this angle can cause hemorrhoids, bloating, constipation, and a butt of other crap. And seriously, unicorn hemorrhoids? The glitter gets everywhere. But what happens when you go from a sit to a squat? Voila, his muscle relaxes and that kink goes away faster than Pegasus laying sweet sherbet dookie. Now your colon's open and ready for battle. That's because our bodies were made to poop in a squat, and now there's a product that lets you squat in your own home. Introducing the Squatty Party. All right, so yeah, constipation is a big reason and a common theme for today is increased intra pressure due to constipation. That's going to cause a uh, increased pressure in the, in the belly, and it's going to start think, pushing things upwards and downwards and causing things to pop out where they shouldn't pop out, such as a hemorrhoid, a unicorn hemorrhoid or otherwise, right? And also a you know, hemorrhoid. Did I say hemorrhoid already? I meant a diverticula. When we talk about diverticulosis, it's just a poppage of a, uh, a weak area of the uh, sigmoid colon. It just pops out and you get problems because of that, right? So constipation, we got a low fiber diet, all right? That's going to put increased pressure inside the, the lumen of the, gastro, of, the, of the GI tract, okay? So we are high risk for constipation and also we have obesity. Obesity weakens our LES in of itself, right? So all the fat from our diet, if you ever open someone up in, in surgery, not that, that, please be a surgeon first, but when you ever open somebody up and you see that you know, someone is bigger in size, they're gonna have uh, fat everywhere. So the fat will develop all around this opening here. That opening is called, that's the muscles around that are called the cruce. All right, so you got extra cruce fat, okay? So what else? So um, city defecation, all right, that then, that's another reason why you could have increased constipation. But going back to heavy lifting, we got pregnancy, progesterone. Just pregnancy itself is an increased pressure in the admin, but progesterone and estrogen actually weaken the lower esophageal sphincter. So this lower esophageal sphincter here is getting weakened in two fronts, or getting uh, the LES is getting pushed by that big bet baby, and also it's going to get weakened by progesterone, for instance, right? So progesterone causes decreased LES pressure. It weakens that lower esophageal sphincter, okay? So repetitive coughing, vomiting, right? It's like a COPD patient, uh, different position changes that are not great. Those are all gonna increase the pressure pushing that hiatus, push, sorry, pushing that upper, upper uh, stomach through that hiatus, right? Also large meals, do Americans eat large meals? Yes, so that's a, uh, another risk factor as well, 
Okay. So they're going back to weakened LES. So progesterone, that was that was OB. So right now we're going to focus on more med surgery kind of things. But uh, smoking, so smoking breaks apart uh, elastic tissues. That's what the, the pathology is behind COPD. The elastic tissue gets broken down, and they get a you know AP diameter, all that other fun stuff. That was med surgery one. Either way, here it's weakening that lower esophageal sphincter. Right. Stress can do it, especially we have increased uh, you know, steroid use that can weaken that lower esophageal sphincter, right? That cause you start breaking down collagen throughout the whole body, and that's going to cause you have collagen right there around that sphincter, okay? And inflammation, chronic inflammation can do it. And what else? Sedentary, obese, you got that fat deposition that's depositing around it and making it making those muscles not work great, okay? And then meds, so different meds that patients might be on might put them at higher risk for hiatal hernias. So we have, what else? We got uh, calcium channel blockers, technically our DHP calcium channel blockers. And what do DHP CCBs end in? What's their suffix? Dipine, or dipine, dipine. All right. Nitrates, nitrates relax everything. They relax smooth muscles. They also relax these muscles here, okay? And anticholinergics. The, your GI tract is a parasympathetic organ. So it's a rest and digest organ, right? So if you have an anticholinergic, you are not gonna be able to squeeze great, right? Acetylcholine is used to, you know, to squeeze sphincters. Okay, beta agonists, alpha blockers, and then foods. So fatty foods are really high on, high on the list. They are going to weaken that sphincter when you have fats inside the stomach, not fats that have developed over years because of obesity, but just fats, fatty meals inside the stomach itself will cause a relaxation of that sphincter and allow the, um, the esophagus to make its way upward, right? And then chocolate. Chocolate has fat in it, but also chocolate itself, whatever chemical nature it has, will, have, will also relax that sphincter, right? Caffeine will do it as well. Alcohol will relax the sphincter, and peppermint will do it, all right? So you can chew gum or you can drink coffee. Why does coffee make us poop? Caffeine contracts our intestines and colon. Coffee also stimulates the release of gastric, which increases acid and contractions in the stomach. It also relaxes the valve between the large and small intestine, pushing poop towards the rectum. About 29% of people have to use the restroom within 20 minutes of drinking coffee. That's Medicine Explained. It's been about 20 minutes now, so if you have to go, it's fine. All right. So yeah, so we got big meals. Big meals are increasing the pressure in the chest, right? And I clicked the next, next slide, so hopefully we're good. All right, anyway, so next one. So we got symptoms of a hiatal hernia, right? So we have, uh, we're gonna have the same, similar symptoms to GERD, right? Similar gastroesophageal reflux symptoms, because all, all that stomach acid is brashing up against the, um, that lower esophagus causing pain. You're gonna feel that, right? So you got dyspepsia is the fancy word for what? Heartburn, okay? So these are GER, some GERD symptoms, so we're gonna overlap just a little bit, right? And coming up, we'll, we'll differentiate what uh, chest, the patient might complain of chest pain, and we'll, we'll tell you, we'll kind of differentiate for you what cardiac chest pain looks like versus GI pain, because what's more serious, GI chest pain or cardiac chest pain? Cardiac, so it's important to say, oh, you just, just take a protonics, you'll be fine, right? So you wanna make sure that we are assessing properly, okay? So we'll look at that. But also all that GI content's gonna make its way all the way to the thorax, making you not breathe good, right? Being short of breath. Or it can also make you, uh, you know, you put pressure on the mediastinum and cause your heart to have some aches of the heart. All right? So also you can palpitations because we're starting to, twit, to push up against nerves such as like the sympathetic or the vagus nerve that are there in the thorax, okay? So you get breathless, shortness of breath, especially after eating a large meal. That's a sign that, you know, that you're not able to, uh, you know, that large meal is pushing upwards and it's causing some shortness of breath in, in the thorax, okay? So what's that word say? Early what? Say shitty? No. Satiety, all right? It's frowned upon if you say say shitty. All right, so you have early fullness, so you have early satiety, okay? You might get some belly pain as well, especially if your transverse colon is all the way up in your, in your stomach, okay? All right, what is eructation? Burping. Burping, it's not the other thing, okay? So they get eructations, all right? And they might regurge food, food particles, regurgitate their food bolus and start vomiting and retching, all right? And they'll get, start getting halitosis because they, you know, they get, you know, like a cow, they just 
take up their food, start chewing again, swallow it, and then it comes back right back up. All right. So things we're going to be alert to though are you know what are some complications of hiatal hernia, but Going back a step, the difference between hiatal hernia symptoms and GERD symptoms is that shortness of breath is a big is a big difference, right? Otherwise, there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so complications of hiatal hernia: you can get GERD, right? You don't always get GERD, right? Sometimes the you know the, the, the gods are with you and your sphincter stays intact the whole time, but usually anatomically it's going to stretch and you're going to get GERD, right? You can have you know not every single hiatal hernia patient develops GERD, okay? But usually, most commonly, you're going to widen that, that lower esophageal sphincter, and you're going to get GERD, right? And you get dyspepsia, regurgitation, coughing. Those are signs of GERD as well, okay? And then you get ulcers that can develop, gastric ulcers, epigastric pain. You're going to start getting a stomach content over here that's highly exposed to acid more than the rest of the stomach, so you can get ulcers there. You can get an upper GI bleed because you can ulcerate and ulcerate and ulcerate until you eat away through the mucosal layer, through the, the, um, the muscle layer of the, of the stomach into the arteries and veins that are beneath that. And you can start causing GI bleed, right? And sometimes it might just be a slow trickle bleed. It might be a bleed that's over like a month. And that can lead to what's called iron deficiency anemia, IDA. We'll talk about hematology for exam two. So that's just, that's, for the final, we can connect the dots at that time, right? The final is chemo, by the way. All right, anyways, gastric volvulus. So that's where the whole uh, whole stomach and other contents have made their way up into the th thoracic cavity. So gastric volvulus and incarceration of that volvulus is a life-threatening uh, situation where you need surgery immediately, okay? So we got age, smoking, obesity, all causing a lax diaphragmatic esophageal hiatus, right? So we have different types of hiatal hernias. So you can just have just a little bit up there, or you can have more of it up there, or you can have even more contents up top, right? You get ulcerations, you can get perforation if that ulcer gets big enough, it could perforate through the wall into the abdominal cavity, okay? That's true with any ulcer. When we talk about peptic ulcer disease, that is also a complication. You got upper GI bleed, you get iron deficiency anemia and gastric volvulus. There we got early satiety. We got retching and vomiting of globuses. Okay, and a lot of GERD symptoms, a lot of overlap with GERD. Okay, so these are different types of hiatal hernias. So we got a sliding, which is 95%. That's where it just slides right on up. And now the sphincter is open a little bit, and we have some stomach up there. All right. That can lead to GERD, of course, because we got uh, a weakened sphincter, and that's going to lead, then lead to the complications of GERD, which are Barrett's esophagus and eventually esophageal cancer. Okay, so rolling—that's where a lot of stuff makes its way up there, and now more stuff can make its way up there afterwards. And you can see now it has twisted 180 degrees, and that's going to cause a it be a medical emergency or technically a surgical emergency. All right, so a super diaphrag diaphragmatic gastric volvulus, all right, that's a bad situation, 180 degree turn to the stomach above the diaphragm, and you get what's called an incarcerated gastrum. So we talk about hernias coming up, hernias are going to be a, uh, can worst case scenario, be incarcerated. They can be just herniated, they can be strangulated, or they can be incarcerated, all right? So what else? We got uh, sign of symptoms. How, what kind of symptoms are you going to get with your, with your belly inside your, inside your thorax? You're definitely going to be short of breath. Right? You definitely have some chest pain. What else will you have? This should, this should make sense. You have difficulty swallowing if your whole, whole GI tract is inside your chest. I think so. Right? And you got uh, retching despite prokinetics. What's a prokinetic? Someone say it? It's something that's for, ener for moving. What's moving? What's that? GI motility. So what's a drug that increases GI motility? Reglin, Reglin right? And we don't do brand names. We, what's the generic name? Metoclopramide, right? Not metronidazole. That's an antibiotic. Metoclopramide is our prokinetic that we have to know for IV push checkoffs too. Okay? You can start getting GI bleeds, and that's a bad situation. So that's a medical emergency, medical surgical emergency where all of the GI contents have made their way upwards and, and twisted into the thorax. Okay, so weak diaphragm, 
and a movement of that, all those GI contests can start causing ischemia and infarction of that tissue, and that can lead to a bad situation. All right, so GI bleeding. So this is a precursor for next week. We'll talk about a lot more GI bleeding next week, but uh, ulceration, like peptic ulcer disease, is a common reason for GI bleeding. GERD and hiatal hernia are low in the list, but they can still cause a GI bleed. So anywhere along the GI tract, from your mouth to your anus, can bleed. Okay, so anywhere can bleed, and if you are close to that opening, it's going to be bright red. Okay, so if you have a mouth bleed, it's going to be bright red blood, right? If it's in the stomach, your stomach can digest things for how long? Two to four hours, right? It takes your stomach to digest things, and it, it gets oxidized. And then if you vomit that up, it's going to be coffee ground. It's going to be darker in color. It's not going to be bright red anymore. So we have upper GI bleeds and lower GI bleeds. Technically, it's above this, what's called a ligament of trites, right? Which is what hang, which holds up the duodenum. So anything from the duodenum up is an upper GI bleed, okay? And if it's in the stomach, it can cause a, and it's been there for a second, it's gonna be coffee ground emesis. What if it's a massive bleed, and it's like a huge bleed in the stomach, and is blood irritating, or does it taste good? It's irritating, right? It's gonna irritate the line of the stomach and you're gonna throw it up, right? It doesn't, your GI tract does not like it. it. When you have blood in your GI tract, it causes you to have diarrhea, right? This is why all your vampire friends have diarrhea all the time, right? So it's causing a, you know, it's, if it's a bright, it's a brisk bleed, it's a really fast bleed, you're gonna throw that up. And that's called throwing up blood, right? Or hematemesis, right? So hema being blood, emesis being thrown up, right? And you have to differentiate it with hemoptysis. When we talk about like TB, for instance, and certain, um, what else? So certain other disease processes, we have hemoptysis. That's not a, that's not the same as hematemesis, all right? So how do you tell the difference? You can put a, an NG tube in to figure out if it's coming from the stomach or not, okay? So not bloody restless secretions, but bloody GI contents from the, from the from the stomach, that's called hematemesis, or it could be coffee ground emesis, right? So coffee ground means it's been there for a second, all right, at least an hour, okay? So that's upper GI bleed, okay? And then lower GI bleed, you can have melena. So melena is a nice name. Melena means what? It means black tarry stools, all right? In, in medicine. So black tarry stools means you have, it's been in the GI tract for like six to eight hours. It's been making its way all the way from the stomach, all the way down. It's probably a slower bleed. It can even be a bleed from this side of the, of the colon and it makes its way all the way up and, and around. And that's called a, that's called a melena, right? Me, or melanotic stools is how they, how they would describe it. So it's black tarry stools, okay? And then uh, hematochesia is the next one. Chesia is, Latin or Greek for stool, right, or, or sheet, right? So hematochesia is what? That's bright red blood per rectum. So you have bright red blood coming out, right? And the, the key difference, key thing to note here is that hematochesia can be an upper GI bleed also, because if you're bleeding super fast in your stomach, it's gonna, not gonna take six to eight hours to get all the way down, right? It's gonna be like a hot potato along the duodenum, you know, jejunum, ileum, you know, colon all the way on, on the way out, right? So if you have bright red blood per rectum, you can't just assume it's a lower GI bleed. It could be an upper GI bleed. You often see the GI doctor trying to, trying to set up for an EGD, which is a scope to the, to the stomach, right? It's like, what are you going? It's coming out the other end. You're going the wrong, wrong way, wrong hole, right? So that's, that, no, that's, they're trying to make sure it's not something upper, okay? All right, so beyond the little ligament of trites, which holds up the duodenum there, right? So we got upper GI bleeds, and we got lower GI bleeds. Any questions on GI bleeds? Okay, and how does a hiatal hernia cause a GI bleed? So it gets ulcerated, it gets eros erosive. It gets eroded by the stomach contents. It erodes and erodes and erodes, eats through the mucosal layers down to the artery, the arterial down below, and it's gonna then cause a bleed. Okay, so diagnostic test for hiatal hernias. So here we have the what called, what's it called? A barium swallow. So here's the diaphragm, and you can see this big globus or this big uh, area above the diaphragm, right? And these are uh, stage one through four. Remember four was the, was the really bad one where everything's above the diaphragm, okay? 
and they can even do a CT scan at that point to see exactly what they're working with because they're probably going to have to go to surgery to figure out how they're going to fix this. Okay, so we have a, um, this is just a representation. Here's a barium swallow they could do, and then they could go in with a endoscope. And they go in there with a EGD endoscope. They go in there with a little scope, and they can actually pull the hiatal piece down. And they can even put little, little staples around it to make sure it's not going to make its way back up there. So your endoscope or your EGD is a diagnostic tool, and it's also an interventional tool. It can also intervene and fix your um, any kind of GI case. Sir, do we go? All good. So yeah, so we have the ability to. Uh, to diagnose and to scope the patient and fix things within the patient, okay? So what else? So we got an endoscope, right? It's a mainstay GI procedure, right? If you park, if you park next to a GI doctor, you'll find your, your tailpipe has been endoscoped and you get back. It says courtesy of, you know, Dr. Pruthi, right? So it's gonna say, you know, cause it, it's a, it's a, it's a money-making procedure too, but it's also in a lot of different, uh, Different in the literature, it tells you it's it's you got to assess if there's a bleed or not because they bleed too much, you can get anemic and they can they get syncopal and fall over. It can be all kinds of whole big deals like why didn't you scope the patient? Okay, <laughs> what does EGD stand for? Esophago gastro duodenoscopy. All right, so we're assessing we can assess the esophagus, we can assess the gastrum, we can assess the duodenum, right, and also the um, we can even get a little fancier with another scope with another attachment to go up into the uh, biliary tree and look at the pancreas. Okay. All right. So what else? So if you're going to get an EGD, it requires consent. Why does it require consent? It's invasive, right? So an invasive procedure requires consent and there are complications that can result. And usually nine times out of 10, the, the complications are from the sedation itself that you give for the procedure, right? Like your patient comes back from an EGD, you want to assess vital signs, right? Assess the vital signs and make sure the blood pressure is not going down. Okay. Also, the sedation they get is going to be uh, an amnesic, right? It's not a pleasant experience to get an EGD or a colon uh, colonoscopy. It's the same tube. They just washed, you know, between between uses. So, and also the colonoscopy is a little bit a little bit longer too. Okay. So we have a uh, an EGD. It requires can have a good complication of hypotension, but also they can go they can go hard and they can poke through the esophagus or poke through the stomach or poke through the duodenum. So perforation is a possibility, and also bleeding afterwards depends on their diagnosis. But sometimes some diagnoses are more higher risk for bleeding than others. Okay, so what's the most common complication though? It's hypotension. Okay, so before they go for the procedure. They need to be uh, NPO for about four to six hours, and they're going to go in there and they're going to, uh, you know, that's, that's so they can actually look at the stomach, make sure there's not, oh, look, there's your pizza, right? Now, we want to actually have a stomach that's been emptied for two to four hours, right? You want to be an empty stomach so we can assess what's going on, if there's a bleed there, if there's ulceration there, if there's a hiatal hernia there, right? And after they come back from the EGD, they, they numb the back of the throat, so they're a high risk for what? Aspiration, right? They can't eat pizza until when? They can safely swallow, right? You can try some ice chips and see if they if they swallow that fine, and then it's, you can progress to pizza. Okay, all right. So monitorability to swallow that they have a gag reflex. Okay, so when we do hiatal hernia EGDs, we're looking for a piece of the stomach where it shouldn't be, right? And how do you know you hit the stomach? Well, if you're above the diaphragm and you start seeing what rugae, you're you know that you're not you're you have gone through the hiatus and you have herniated, right? You have a piece of the stomach above the diaphragm where it shouldn't be. Okay, so that's it for diagnostics for hiatal hernias. So treatment, how do you fix a hiatal hernia? So you can do several things. You just do symptom management. That's where you recommend, uh, you know, lifestyle changes and such, right? We can make sure that we are, you're losing weight. We're going to lose that abdominal pressure. Right, we can improve our diet, right? That, so we're not having, so we have more fiber or less fiber, more fiber, right? So to decrease, to improve constipation. Well, that's kind of hard, to, weird way to say it. To get rid of constipation, because you improve constipation, that means you have more constipation. Anyways, so you have prokinetics, right? Such as metoclopramide, right? And what's the complication of metoclopramide? What's the side effect? What's that? Diarrhea, well, that's the intended effect. Constipation, no, that wouldn't be a prokinetic then. 
What is it? Electrolyte, Electrolyte maybe. If you have diarrhea, you're pooping out all the potassium. What else? You're on the right track with electrolyte concept. Doesn't affect your electrolytes, but it affects. What's that? Say again. You said NMS, yeah, neuro, neuro, uh, not neuromuscular, but uh, neuroepileptic syndrome. But uh, more specific, EKG wise. Mm -hmm. What is it? QT prolongation. There's the, there it is. So it can cause torsades, right? You have metoclopramide and you're not watching the EKG, it can cause torsades, right? Because the QTC gets longer and longer and longer. It doesn't drop, it goes in the torsades, okay? All right, so metoclopramide, right? It's gonna stimulate gastric emptying and it actually puts a squeeze on the lower esophageal sphincter. So it's actually going to improve GERD symptoms when you give metoclopramide, okay? So surgical management, we can do a laparoscopic and Nissan fundification, an L and F, okay? And that's where you do laparoscopically, you buy a Nissan car. <laughs> no, a laparoscopic Nissan, is, that's God that discovered it. All right, Nissan fund application. So you're gonna work with the fundus of the um, stomach and you're gonna placate it, all right? You're gonna placate it. That means you're, isn't that an adjective in English class? You're gonna placate someone or placate someone. Anyways, you're going to just take it around. You're gonna take it for a little ride and you're going to staple it on the other side. You're gonna tighten it up a little bit, okay? So there's an example of a Nissan fund application here. If I can get it to play. I'm not able to use my cursor just yet. Anyways, we got a, the stomach is wrapped around itself and it's, it kind of forms a tight uh, seal around the lower esophagus, right? That way, here's the food will go down this way now and now it's, a, it's gonna be more difficult for that to herniate, right? And then gastric reduction, to do gastric bypass. This is usually when you have some ulceration or something like that. And we're gonna take out a piece of the stomach and we're just going to um, create a straight shot to the duodenum or even to the jejunum if we're doing a ruined Y procedure. So we're taking out a piece of the stomach because of ulceration or because of damage, okay? What else? So we can do a gastroplexy or gastropexy. That's where you're just doing it. Um, so you just stomach, you attach the stomach to the diaphragm. It's like, don't move. I'm going to staple you right there to the, to the underneath the diaphragm, right? That sounds a little bit barbaric, but this is what we do for our pets. This is, what, this is the veterinary move. All right, there's gonna, your dog, dog has a hiatal hernia. We're going to staple its stomach to the, the diaphragm so it doesn't make its way back up into the hiatus, right? And then herniotomy or a herniography. herniography. This guy is where you're going to fix the hernia itself. You're going to reduce it, and you can even put a mesh in place. And that mesh is going to tighten up that, um, that hiatus, right? So remember when you get older or bigger, obese-wise, the fat will infiltrate there and make it weak. So we're gonna put a mesh there so it doesn't, uh, so it's diff more difficult for you to go on a hiatus and herniate, okay? So teaching for the laparoscopic, what's called? Nissan fund application, all right? So they need to be eating a soft diet for a week. They shouldn't swallow air. Oh, sorry, this is after, afterwards, sorry. Afterwards, they shouldn't swallow air. All right, so how do you not swallow air? You should think about it, I guess. But you can not use a straw, right? Don't use a straw. That's going to be sucking more air than is good, okay? And don't be chewing gum, all right? Don't drinking uh, any CO2 or carbonation. What else? No gum we talked about and no lemonade. So I had to look this up, but, uh, you know, lemons are citric acid, and you put make, mix citric acid with the bicarb in your stomach, that makes CO2 bubbles. All right, so here's a chemical formula for those that like chemistry. All right, so you mix citric acid with bicarb, which is also in your stomach a little bit, right? Your mucus cells secrete mucus, and they secrete bicarb to neutralize all the hydrochloric acid at the base of the stomach. So avoid lemonade, avoid orange juice and other citric acid things as well. All right, this, what caused the hiatal hernia in the first place was, was probably some increased intra pressure. So we're going to make sure that we're not doing any heavy lifting. But do they, does that mean they need to stay bed rest? No, usually that's an older uh, paradigm where you have to you know, be, be bed rest after surgery. Usually you wanna move after surgery to avoid atelectasis, all kinds of other post-op complications, okay? All right, so if they, they want to be able to call you and call 911, not 911, but call the nurse office if they are unable to burp, all right? They have excessive satiety. They're like full all the time, all right? They have difficulty swallowing. This is supposed to fix that, all right? And they have any kind of GI bleeding. So what are you going to tell them? Tell me you have any hematochesia. They're going to say, say again. 
hematochesia, right? So what are you going to tell them? A bright red blood per rectum, or what else? Black tarry stool, or if they're coughing up. Now, like we know that coughing is might be respiratory, but if they're vomiting up uh, blood, or they're vomiting up something that looks coffee ground and dark, dark red in, in appearance. Okay, so we all got to be able to teach to that. Okay, and any kind of laparoscopic surgery, you're going to report, or any surgery for ge in general, really, if they get a fever afterwards, right? Any drainage, any dehiscence. What is dehiscence? That's a, a wound that is opening up, right? They'll have the little steri strips as a laparoscopic procedure. They're a little steri strip to keep them, keep that little holes closed, right? Get a laparoscopic procedure, I think, here it is, right here, right? They put in like three holes, four holes, five holes, and they insufflate it with CO2 so they can go around and see what they're doing and do all kinds of amazing things with a little scope, right? And those, there's, you don't want those to pop open. You want to keep those closed, okay? And then no baths for 10 days, and they can use soap and water in the meantime. So let me see if I can get this to play real quick, because I know this is a, an actual video. Nope. Okay. Anyways, that's a Nissan fundification where they're going to pull a bunch of GI contents through the hole, and they're going to wrap around the top of the stomach, around the esophagus, and they just staple it together. Okay. All right. So nursing interventions. So we talked about what to do for an LNF, a laparoscopic Nissan fundification. But what else can you do? You can promote gastric emptying as someone that's not getting surgery, or these also actually apply to the GERD as well, right? So they should be uh, on their left side and head to bed elevated 30 degrees because you want the GI contents. It's more difficult for GI contents to to go up with their, when you're sitting up, right? So at least 30 degrees, and why the left side? Because anatomically. That's, you know, you, you don't want all this fluid leaking down through that, you know, that weak lower esophageal sphincter, right? And that's someone on their what side right there? On their right side. Can you visualize it? It's this person right here. It's their stomach taken out, right? So you don't want to be on the right side. You want to be on the left side. So you have a little, little nest of gastric fluids that might be there. And then it can, you know, squeeze all that stuff in the duodenum. It can do, go through the normal GI process. But we want to make sure they're on which side? On their left side, right? So which one of these is correct? The ones that have check marks, but they have they are supine, right? On the left side is fine. What's even better, right? What's like what's a three-star Yelp review? Is you're up how many degrees? Thirty degrees, right? They even sell pillows on Amazon that are like this, right? And actually pillows aren't recommended unless that's all they have, but pillows are can deflate over time, right? So there's wedges that you can buy that will um, lift the, the top of the bed, right? So you can, put, you can just sit on, lay in a wedge, or you can even raise the, the head of the bed by six to eight inches, and that will be, or six to 12 inches, and that will uh, promote what? The drainage of the GI contents by gravity, right? So pillars, pillows are not adequate. You can use a wedge if you need to, right? What else on this? So eat two hours before sleeping, and why is that? It takes how long to digest, digest food? two to four hours. So if you have a meal within two hours of bedtime, it's not going to leave your stomach because you're going to have more meal in your stomach and you're going to have more gastric juices in your stomach and you're at high risk of all this GI contents from spilling up upwards through that weak lower esophageal sphincter. Okay? And avoid big meals in general. All right? So don't do big meals. Do what kind of meals? Little small meals about six to eight times per day. Little small meals throughout the day. Okay? So let's see if this... We'll play the video. There we go. The abdomen. So if you sleep on your left hand side, the stomach and its contents lie slightly lower than the esophagus, so less chance of it refluxing back up. By the same principle, if you lie on your right hand side, at this point, the stomach and its contents are slightly higher than the lower esophageal sphincter and more chance of reflux back into the esophagus. Again, if you suffer from acid reflux, you might want to consider avoid lying flat or with just one pillow because this increases the chances of reflux. Instead, try using two pillows to raise your head so gravity works in your favor and reduce the chance of reflux. Okay, so that's an example. But do you use pillows? It's not recommended. You should use a wedge or something designed to do this. Okay, all right. So that's the, the deal with uh, sleep teaching. So sleep teaching, it sounds like a good SATA question, doesn't it? All right, so what's some good, good ways, things that are true, false, that I, I could tell a patient to, uh, to do or not do, right? Same thing with what position would be great for a patient, right? 
All right, so avoid increased intra-abdominal pressure. So this is like over time, we gotta make sure we're losing weight, right? So they have to do a low fat diet, high fiber, right? Straining, heavy lifting should be avoided. All right, avoid tight clothing. Tight clothing can put pr extra pressure on the abdomen, right? Not a lot of people wear corsets nowadays, especially the guys in the room, but a lot of corsets can cause a lot of extra in increased intra-abdominal pressure, okay? We gotta manage the LES, so we don't want the lower sacral sphincter to weaken, right? So we can, we can, it can get pushed open because of the intra-abdominal pressure, but we can avoid foods that relax the lower sacral sphincter, so fatty foods, greasy foods, so fat directly weakens that sphincter. We mentioned chocolate, peppermint, caffeine does it, right? ETOH, especially red wine, what is ETOH again? That's alcohol, ethylene alcohol, all right? So these guys will weaken and relax the lower sacral sphincter and avoid foods that just open it all together, all right? So when you burp, that means it came from your stomach and your sphincter opened up, all right? So avoid carbonated bre beverages and what kind of juices? Citric acid, citrus juices, right? And we got uh, vinegar, we'll also react, acetic acid will react, react with bicarb, and tomatoes. Tomatoes have like 10 different acids in them, so they, they're gonna react and cause some CO2 creation as well, okay? So avoid opening with increased intraduminal pressure. All right, discuss meds that might relax the low esophageal sphincter, such as what? What's some examples of meds that might uh, relax the low esophage lower esophageal sphincter? A cow shower blocker can do it, right? And some, you know, nitroglycerin might do it. Like a, some people are like an isosorbide dinitrate, which is the nitrate, right? And that can relax the sphincter. And then smoking independently will relax the sphincter. Okay. So diet-wise, they're going to be what kind of diet? It can be a healthier diet to lose weight, but also high fiber. So I freaking fricked and fricked up potato chips. I freaking fricked up, bro. I ate these protein cookies. These protein cookies. They're like keto. I was like snacky snack without getting, you know. And there's fiber in them. Three grams. See, three grams of fiber. Literally. Every two seconds. <laughs> like, I can't. I got IBS, brother. Like, <laughs> All right, high fiber has other side effects too.